Okay, good afternoon. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, get started with um, the this uh, uh, test problem. I would like to finish this one and then uh, we'll go back to the slides. So this is the the problem uh, regarding. Um, defining the given coupled model, <coughs> which includes uh, the heater, the fan, and the AC. <coughs> and last time we uh, concluded that um, when we look at the state space for the coupled model, um, the state space is not going to be equal to uh, the entire Cartesian product of the individual states <coughs> uh, <coughs> because of the definition of S fan uh, the fan comes on only when both uh, the heater and the AC are on so the, the next thing I'd like to do is to <coughs> look at the input <coughs> so we need to define the, the input set to the system and the input set to the system is going to be based on the input ports. So in this case, we have two input ports. So we have to consider uh, the input sets for each port. <coughs> and so we're going to look at this one and this one. So the input set for the coupled model or coupled system, uh, in this case, it's just going to be equal to the Cartesian product <coughs> of the input set for uh, the first port, it's HVAC sub, um, and the other one is the second one, HVAC sub, which is equal to uh, the input to the heater and the input to the AC. So we have this input and this input. And uh, this is equal to Uh, three and four. <coughs> the input to the AC uh, is eleven and twelve, according to according according to the description. So this is for the heater, and uh, this is the input uh, for the AC, eleven and twelve. Okay, so we just take the Cartesian product because we have a pair, so a pair of ports. So the Cartesian product is going to have uh, uh, a set of pairs. So three eleven, uh, we have three twelve, then uh, four eleven, and four and twelve. Okay, so in this case, uh. All these four inputs are possible. <coughs> so moving on, we are going to look at the output. Uh, so for the output of the system, we have, I think we have three outputs. So again, we're going to look at the picture. We have one, two, three outputs. So we have to consider the output for each port. Okay? So in this case, uh, we have the output. Um, one. And we have the output two. And 
and the third one and uh, according to the picture this is coming from the heater and uh, the next one is coming from the fan and the third one is coming from uh, the AC This is five, six, and the next output is coming from the fan. So this one should be, so this one coming from the fan, it should be, so the output from the fan, which is 1920. So this is a 19 and 20 and then we have the output from the AC which I think is 15 16 so we're going to take a Cartesian product of sets we have three sets so we're going to have triples uh, as elements of the output set for the uh, coupled system so uh, we're going to have, for example, 5, 19, uh, 15, 5, 19, 16, then uh, 5, uh, let me do 20, 15, uh, I'll do 5, 20, 16 and then I'll go to so one one two three four so I'll go to six uh, 19 15 uh, 6 19 16 uh, we have 6 20 15 and uh, 6. 20, uh, 16. I think this is it. Did I leave out any? This is good. Okay. Are all these out outputs possible? No, they're not possible because Because um, <clears throat> remember, we said that um, the system can only go in uh, these states. So we identified four states this state, this state, this one, and this one. So all the outputs associated with uh, these other uh, states will not be possible. Okay? So in this case, um, we can look at the following outputs. Uh, 5, 19, and 15. Is this one possible? 5, 19, 15? Yes, yes that's possible. 5, 19, 16? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 5, 20, 15 is not possible. Why not? So this is not possible. Why? What does it mean to have a 15? If the fan is producing a 15, it means it's off. How about 20? It's coming from the AC. That means the AC is on. So that's not possible. Okay. So we can use a similar uh, reasoning and we can rule out um, this one as a 16 and a 5, 20. One is on, one is off. So that's not possible. Um, 6, 19, 16 is not possible. Uh, 6, 20, 15, that's not possible. So we have uh, four outputs that are possible. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? <coughs> so the, the last part is... Um, 
is the next state function This is a little bit more involved. So now we would like to define the next state function for the coupled model. Okay. So how should we define this one? <coughs> we are going to look at, um, we're going to consider the, um, all the possible states so I'll just go back to the beginning here. So we can actually consider all these states if we want to. And all the possible inputs and then determine what state we go to next. Okay? But we already know that some of these states are not possible. Okay? So we can just consider the states that are possible. Okay? But for the sake of um Illustration. I'll just go ahead and uh, look at all the possible, uh, all the possibilities for this particular system, uh, if if I can. So this is going to be equal to. Uh, let me start with um, the following state: one, nine, seventeen. The system can be in this state. <coughs> And uh, for in this particular state, we have several possible inputs. Let's assume the input is 3 and 11. Then what should be the next state of the system? So this is assuming uh, everything is off, right? Then we receive a 3 and 11. So if you go back to the picture, we are saying we're going to receive a 3 uh, we're going to receive a 9 and we're going to have uh, so we're going to receive a 1 and a 9 1 and 9 so the input is coming here so with this one and this one so we have a 3 here and we have 11 yeah so 3 11 as the input 3 11 we are in the state where this is a 1, uh, this is a 9, this is a 17, so everything is off. So in that case, what should be the next state? Also remember when, when we write the next state function, we are saying give me the state, give me the input, and then I will tell you what state I will go to. So give me this. I'll tell you my next state. That's what we are doing. So what should be the next state? We stay in the same state. Yeah, so in this case, we're going to stay 1, 9, 17. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a parenthesis here. So this is uh, 11. So that defines uh, the state and the input. And then this one is going to define the next state. So I'm going to put uh, another set of parentheses like this. OK? And uh, we're going to have several of these. So this is the current state. This is the input. And I go to the next state, which is the same state. Okay? So let's do a few of these. Um, another one would be uh, being in the same state. One nine seventeen. Uh, let's assume the input now is a three and twelve. What should be the next state? One ten. So in this case, uh, the AC is going to change state because we have a twelve coming on to the AC. So everything else stays the same. Okay. So I can I can uh, consider um, 1, 9, um, 17. And now my input is going to be, I'll do a 4, 11. 
And then uh, in this case, what should be the next state? Thank you, 2917. 1917. And now I'm going to have a 4 and a 12. Uh, what's the next state now? 2, this is going to be 10. And now we have both of them on, right? So this should be 18. Okay. So I can I can go and I can now look at um, so one more parenthesis one more parenthesis there I can now look at uh, one ten seventeen and I look at the inputs again I'm going to start from three eleven I'll go through the same process. So this would be 1, 9, 17. I can look at the next one. Uh, 1, 10, 17. Now I have a 3, 12. And this is going to be 1. This is, this is going to be a 10, 17. And I can enumerate all of them. So for the sake of time, I'll... I'll skip, I'll just write the, the last one uh, I have here is a 2, 10, 18 uh, with uh, input of 4, 12. So we have 4 and the 12. That's going to go to 2, 10, 18. Okay. And of course, um, we know that some of these are not going to be possible, so we're going to eliminate the ones that are not possible transitions. Okay. Any questions on this one? Okay. Which of those would be possible? Which ones of these are possible and which ones are not possible? Is that the question? Yeah, all the, the question, are these all going to be possible? Yeah, they have to be possible in this case. Uh, so we are not going to delete any of these because the system can receive any inputs and it will be forced to transition accordingly. Right? So the system can receive all these inputs and it's going to transition according to this. Okay, so the last one is the readout function. HVAC sub. Uh, the readout function should be based on the on the states, the possible states for the system that we defined in uh, in this part here. Okay, so the system is going to go to this uh, these states. So we need to define the output for those states. So in this case, uh, we need to have the following. The system can be in state 1, 9, 17. If it is in that state, what should be the output? How many are, we, we, we already defined uh, the set of outputs. Okay, so we have these as the set of outputs. And if you look at the picture, uh, we have a triple because we have three ports, one, two, three. And each component of the triple corresponds to the output for the uh, specific port. 
So in this case, um, if we're in this state, which is the off state, if you will, all the components are off, then the output is going to be uh, a five for the heater, and then we're going to have a 19 coming from the fan, and we're going to have a 15 coming from the AC. Um, the next one is state 19, 17. Uh, in this case, uh, the output is a 5, 19, 16. Uh, the next one is 2, 9, 17. The output in this case is a 6. We have a 9, so should have a 19. Uh, a 17 is going to produce a 15, so we have that. And the last one is the state 2, 10, 18. This is where we have uh, all the components are on. Uh, the output in this case is going to be a 6, a 20, and a 16. Uh, just to uh, mention that uh, the components, the way I arranged the components, I just ordered them according to this. Uh, I noticed uh, some of you uh, made your own arrangements. That's fine, as long as you're consistent. Uh, you don't mix up the, uh, if this is your first component, this is your next one, if this is your third one, then you should uh, just consider that throughout. Okay. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, the homework uh, is going to give you more practice on this. This is very important. That's why I'm going back. Uh, when we create um, simulation models, we actually use uh, these models to do that. So it provides a basis for, uh, for best building and testing your system. Okay, question? In terms of the states, uh -huh, the question is, if, go ahead, would you repeat the question, please? Uh, the, the, the fan is supposed to be on, in this case, uh, if we look at the definition of the fan, uh, the fan is going to be on if it's in state 18. If we assume this is, uh, this is off, this is on. So the fan is in state 18 uh, as long as we have uh, 8 and 14. 8 and 14 as the inputs okay so in this so which means that um, the input coming from the f uh, coming to the fan okay both the inputs are indicating that the heater has to be on and the AC has to be on for the fan to be on that's what this means Okay, so just the definition of the fan requires that uh, it's going to be in state 18 if this is in state 2 and the AC is in state 10. That's what it means. Okay, so you just go by the definition of the fan. Oh, this is just my assumption. Uh, I'm saying that um, if you assume um,
no, 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 no. The, this, um, the question is, what does this physically mean? Does it mean that the, when, the fan is, when the fan is on, it's going to be actually heating and cooling the room at the same time? No. Uh, this particular uh, subsystem could be a case where if you have both of them on, then you need the fan to provide some kind of, uh, it could be some insulation. Sometimes you can separate different areas uh, of temperature using using a fan where it's, you're blowing air in between. Okay, the one you have is more um, is, is more common uh, where the the fan is going to come on. The one in the homework now, the fan is going to come on when either the heater or the AC is on. And this is uh, an exa a typical example of uh, HVAC systems like the one we have here. And I'll show you, an, I'll show you a, a more detailed description uh, in, one of, in, the, in today's lecture, the next set of lectures. Okay? Uh, th this one is not typical. Okay? The one where you have the AC, whenever the AC comes on, then you need the fan to actually drive the, the cold air. Uh, when, or when the heater is on, then you need the fan to actually uh, circulate the, the, uh, the air through convection. <clears throat> okay? All right. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the system engineering documents. Uh, we talked about uh, problem situation. Uh, you have to state the problem. Uh, I noticed some of you are still stating your problem in terms of a solution. Uh, that's not correct. Okay? When you state a problem, you state the problem. You don't tell me how you're going to solve the problem. Okay? You just state this is the problem. This is the issue. Okay? And I'll talk more about this uh, in the next set of slides as well. It's going to take a while for some of you to uh, get out of the habit of stating uh, problems in terms of a solution. For it. Um, that's that's uh, typically um, misleading because it can lead you to uh, come to a suboptimal solution. Okay? We talked about the problem situation and then the customer requirements. Uh, typically, the customer is going to initiate the development of a uh, new system. So the customer is going to say what they want. Uh, in your case, um, you, 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 are the, you are the customer. You are also the system engineer. <laughs> OK? So there's that conflict going on. But you have to you know, think about the customer, uh, play the role of a customer. You're going to define your customer requirements, and then uh, from those customer requirements, you're going to play the role of a system engineer, and then you're going to define uh, the derived requirements. Okay? And uh, so we talked about uh, these three, and uh, system validation is basically uh, making sure that, um, in this case, uh, the requirements, the customer requirements, and the derived requirements, uh, they are complete. You haven't omitted anything. Uh, also, system validation deals with um, if we are looking at uh, technology, buildable design, making sure that um, uh, we can have a, we can actually uh, build a system based on the technology that we have. Okay. So, system validation ensures that a real-world solution can actually be built and tested to prove that uh, the requirements can be met. Okay, so this document is intended for systems engineering. Uh, the next document is concept exploration. Uh, this is where we are going to uh, describe your investigation of alternative designs. And uh, from this exploration, you are going to come up with an initial uh, architecture of your system. 
Okay, so you're going to come up with an incipient uh, architecture. And then um, you are also going to come up with your own criteria to evaluate uh, or compare the different uh, concepts that you're going to come up with. So you have to define your, your trade-off strategy. And this has to be, you are going to do this as a team. Okay? I'll show you, I'll show you exam, an example uh, later. So for now, I'm just telling you what to do. Then uh, I'll, I'll start giving examples. Uh, so I'll give an example today. We're going to start on the, the HVAC system example, and then next week we'll do uh, another example. Okay? Sometimes you do sensitivity analysis in terms of if you change this, then what happens, what's going to be the cost, and so on. Uh, you have to explain the do-nothing alternative. Like I said before, uh, doing nothing is a choice, is an alternative. So you have to explain that. Okay? Uh, the concept of exploration should be readable to, to the public. Okay, so it's a very descriptive problem. The next document is the, um, the use case model. And uh, again, I'm going to def define, go in detail a little bit later. Uh, use cases are going to help us uh, define how the system is going to be used. So we're going to identify all the uses for the system. Uh, these use cases are going to help us discover the functions that the system shall do. So for every use case, we're going to come up with a function the system is going to do. Okay? Uh, this is intended for the management, engineering, the customer, the public, systems engineering. And so this leads to UML, so we have to understand UML documents. And uh, UML is, is, is a standard, okay? Unified modeling language. So we're going to use use cases uh, to basically convey information. Uh, the use case, like I said last time, is basically doing functional decomposition. Uh, as it was called. So let me show you an example of a use case diagram for the traffic light intersection problem. Remember this problem where we had the, the problem was that the farmer was having issues, was having a hard time trying to cross the highway. Okay? So the system was going to be designed to basically help the farmer to, to cross this highway. And so we have a sensor here and we have a sensor here to detect when the tractor is there and then that the, the sensor can uh, help uh, uh, control the traffic lights basically change the color of the traffic lights so the farmer can, can actually cross mm -hmm. so in this case um, we can come up with a use case diagram and uh, I want to go through this one quickly uh, so a use case is going to be represented by an oval diagram. So this one presents a use case. And the use case is control lights. That's the use case. Okay. So basically we are looking at the problem and we identify that we need to have this as a function that the system should do. Control lights. Okay. The other use case is to detect a uh, tractor. Okay, so ignore this use case for now. So let's focus on these two. Also, in, in, within the um, the system, we need to identify the objects in the system. Uh, in UML, they are called actors, so they are drawn as stick diagrams. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a tractor. A tractor is going to interact with the system to be designed. Okay, so the interaction is represented by this digraph, this arrow. It goes from the tractor to the use case, indicating that the tractor is going to initiate the communication with this use case. So the tractor comes. Uh, that's going to basically um, uh, let the sensor de detect the tractor. So as soon as the tractor is within uh, the sensor signal, uh, then it's going to activate this use case. Okay. Uh, 
Another one is uh, the timer. Okay, so the timer, this is an interval duration policy. Uh, the timer is going to keep uh, count of how much time has elapsed. And based on how much time has elapsed, it's going to signal this use case, control lights. Okay, so we have an arrow coming from the, this uh, object, if you will, to the use case uh, control lights. In, in, in practice, um, when we look at traffic flow, we would like to synchronize traffic lights. Okay? And in that case, we can have this object, which is neighboring traffic signal. This can help us do the synchronization that we need to help traffic uh, flow. Okay? Because you don't want to stop at a traffic light, then you drive at the next one, you stop, and at the next one, you stop, and at the next one, you don't want that. So you want to be able to synchronize so that you can drive through several traffic lights before you, you, you actually hit another, uh, another red. Okay? So that's what this would imply. Now, uh, sometimes actually traffic lights fail. Okay, so we can have a special, a special case when the traffic lights are not working. So in this case, um, uh, this use case diagram includes uh, these control broken lights. So control broken lights is a use case which is going to control uh, the traffic lights basically when something is wrong. Okay, and in this case, um, uh, this this uh, control broken light use case is actually going to initiate the communication with the, the traffic lights and the highway lights. So the objects we have are the farm road lights, the highway lights, the tractor, uh, neighboring traffic signal, interval duration policy. These are the objects we have in our system. Um, in this case, uh, when, when, when uh, you have broken lights, uh, something else should be able to detect that the lights are broken. That's why this, the digraph goes from this use case to the object. So you can have a digraph going from the use case to the object or from an object to the use case. You can also have a use case that doesn't go anywhere in terms of uh, having a digraph coming out. Okay. You can think of this as going to be part of the system to be designed. Okay. Something is going to interact with this uh, detect structure or the sensor within the system. Okay. Uh, one more thing I need to explain about this picture is this uh, digraph with an open arrowhead. Uh, again, if you uh, look in the lecture slides, uh, what does this mean? Based on my lecture, new email. Evis. You forgot? Yeah. Okay, if, uh, an open arrowhead uh, means um, ex an extension. So this says extends. So you can think of this as uh, a general case. And this is going to be a special case. So this type of digraph uh, represents um, inheritance in, in uh, when we talk about object-oriented programming. Okay? So inheritance has to do with, uh, uh, if you think about the parent uh, use case as this one, then this one is just going to be a special case of this. Okay? Uh, so it's generalization. It's a very powerful concept in object-oriented programming. Okay? So again, review those slides because uh, different um, diagrams and different digraphs are going to show up. Each one has a meaning, as a definition, because this is a standard. So we have to go by the standard. Uh, if I give somebody in Europe to read this use case, they should read it the same way as I'm reading it. We should have the same interpretation. That's the whole point. Okay, so this is just a special case of uh, con uh, control broken lights, the control lights use case. Okay. Any questions on this uh, example use case diagram? 
So typically, we, when we are designing systems, we actually spend a lot of time uh, coming up with use case diagrams. Um, and then we discuss these. And these are going to help discover the functions the system shall do. Okay? So you can go to each use case and uh, basically derive the functions the system has to do. Okay, so that's going to be the use case uh, part of your documentation. And I uh, will show more examples later. So the next document is going to be the design model. Uh, this is where now you have selected your, uh, your conceptual design. You, you, you're going to pick one concept. And now you're going to provide more details. And the design model is going to consist of several uh, UML diagrams and uh, descriptions. Uh, you are going to have class diagrams. Uh, again, the class diagram is going to uh, show the different uh, objects within your system, how they are represented. Uh, what are the, uh, the, the methods or functions that each is going to represent. Uh, a class diagram can represent uh, the subsystems. So each subsystem is going to be represented as a class. It can represent the components. It can re represent the subcomponents and so on. And it's, gonna, it's going to list uh, what each entity uh, is going to do and what kind of um, attributes uh, each entity is going to have. Okay, class diagrams, they are also described in the UML uh, slides. Uh, communication diagrams is going to show how the different subsystems and components are going to communicate. Uh, sequence diagram, I gave an example on this one. Uh, it's going to provide scenarios for how information is going to flow with respect to time and the interaction among the entities involved in that scenario. Uh, state machine diagrams, this is the state transition diagrams. It's going to capture the state transitions for your system. Uh, so you are going to have uh, state transition diagrams uh, at different levels of the system hierarchy. You can have a state transition diagram for a component. You can have a state transition diagram for a subcomponent, uh, for a subsystem. You can have a state transition diagram for the whole system. Okay? Sometimes <laughs> having a state transition diagram for the whole system may be uh, a little bit too uh, complicated. So that's why we break down these um, state transition diagrams and look at them at different uh, levels of the system hierarchy. Component diagrams are going to show the different uh, uh, entities within your system, how they are, um, how they are coupled. Um, deployment diagrams uh, show how the system is going to look like in its environment. Uh, all these are UML diagrams. Okay? Uh, if you go online, go on the internet, you can search on each one of these and you'll find tons and tons of information. Okay? So everybody is going to understand each of these diagrams uh, on your own. So I'm going to assume you can go read and find that information. Um, the other thing you need to include in your design model are system models. Uh, so far, we have just looked at one type, the discrete, uh, discrete time. Okay? Uh, I would like to also uh, cover discrete event models uh, after I finish with the system development process so you can also be uh, aware of those models. But we include those mathematical models uh, in our design as well. Uh, these may be useful for certain components. Uh, and they may not be as useful for you know, the higher level uh, uh, maybe, maybe subsystems they may be good for specific components or subcomponents, depending on the application. Okay, so the design model will be expanded. Uh, once you finish your design model, 
then that's going to be expanded into uh, an implementation model. The implementation model is now what we can actually um, uh, build as a simulation of the system. We can build the whole thing into software. And uh, after we we can actually even run the simulation and consider it as operational. But eventually, that's what we want to uh, use to implement the real, the real thing, the real system. Okay. So the design uh, model document is going to involve a lot of work. That's why you have to work, you're working in teams. Uh, some are going to be working on uh, state, state machine diagrams. Some of you will be doing sequence diagrams and so on. So you have to uh, divide the tasks. Unless you are, on, you are, you are working uh, by yourself on the project, then you're going to do everything on your own. Okay. The last document, which is mappings and management, this is a document that um, basically shows how things are related. So the mappings, uh, you are going to show um, the relationships between the requirements, documents, the customer requirements, and the derived requirements. So you are going to have a list of the customer requirements and you're going to map them to the derived requirements. Okay? Um, remember when you do validation, um, you are going to basically do that. So by this time, you're going to have that information. So you're going to include the information in this particular part of your report. Uh, again, the verification plan of document three, the derived requirements, you have to also include it, include it here how you are going to verify that um, you've met all the customer requirements. Uh, the concept exploration evaluation criteria you are going to use, uh, you're going to include it here. Okay. Uh, how, how do we evaluate the different uh, conceptual designs? We are going to basically come up with different uh, performance measures to each one. And then we are going to have a list of these uh, performance measures. You can do rankings if you want. And then you're going to do the comparison. So that information should be included here. OK? You also have to show mappings between uh, the use cases and the uh, objects in your design model. That has to be included in this document. And all other management-related uh, documentation should be included in this section, uh, such as activity diagrams, which may show the activities um, of the components, subcomponents, and so on in your system. Also, may show the activities of the team, the tasks, uh, users' manual. <laughs> okay. In your case, you don't need to come up with a user's manual. Um, but if you're doing, um, if, if you're doing, like when I was in school, we had to do software engineering. We had to build a system from scratch. Then in the end, we, we developed a software system. Then we also had to write a manual of how you use the software. <laughs> so by the time you finish your project, you're going to have a manual. Okay, but in your case, um, you don't need to have a user's manual. Uh, risk analysis, uh, paper charts, schedules, uh, everything is included in this uh, last document. Okay? The order in which documents are started and finished, you're going to start with the problem situation, the problem statement. And you've already done that. Uh, for the most part, you just need to go and refine your problem statement, uh, especially if it includes solutions there or here and there. Um, the last document to finish is going to be the first document you're going to start with. So you start with the problem situation, and you're going to end with the problem situation as your last document. Okay? Because we want you to go back to the beginning and also include an executive summary of uh, what's the preferred design you have, okay? And what are the, you know, the pros 
and cons about your design. Okay? So we start with document one, we end with document one. The next document after you do problem situation is you are going to basically, uh, which you have done this already, some of it, you're going to basically lay out the tasks, how you're going to do the work. Okay, so you start, you go to document number eight, mappings and management, so you start on that. Um, then you go to uh, document number, so this is number number two, the third document is going to be you have the problem situation, you lay out your tasks, your schedules, then now you can do the concept exploration. Uh, concept exploration, you need to do functional decomposition, so you have to do the use cases. Um, from the use cases, you start looking at the customer requirements. This is just the order, okay? Uh, customer requirements, when you look at the problem situation, you'll also be interacting with the customer at that point. Uh, then you come here now, you start doing your customer requirements, writing those down. Then uh, derived requirements, from the customer requirements, come up with your derived requirements. And then uh, number seven, uh, system validation. And uh, the last one is going to be the design model. So you're going to go to do design after you've done everything else. Okay? That's when you start doing your design. This is just the order in which you, you are going to start. This is not written in stone, but this is just a guideline. Okay? Uh, order in which documents are finished is, is shown here. Uh, you have to finish your use cases first. Okay, make sure you finish your use cases. Uh, then uh, you go to your customer requirements. Okay, because after you lay out the use cases, then you have to go back to the customer um, to make sure that you have captured all the use cases. Okay? So you have the functions that the system shall do. You go to the customer and make sure that this is what you want the system to do. <laughs> okay? But you're going to be the customer, you're going to be the system engineer, so you're going to be doing both yourselves. Okay? So, my suggestion is when you lay out your customer requirements, uh, keep in mind that the customer requirements are going to, are going to uh, drive the derived requirements. If your customer requirements are overwhelming, your derived requirements are going to be even more overwhelming. Okay? So if your system is going to be doing a lot of things, as your customer, you want the system to do this, that, 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 then for each one, you have to come up with derived requirements. Okay? So uh, the complexity of the system is going to depend on how you define your customer requirements and also the application that you have chosen. All right, any questions on this? Uh, let me just uh, mention, highlight a few things. Uh, I said I'm not going to cover risk management. Um, we assume that uh, students take um, take a risk management course. Um, I think 627 and some other course probably they cover these things. A decision analysis. So here I'll just highlight a few things. Um, one of the greatest challenges, as we have mentioned, is balancing uh, cost, risk, and the, uh, the result. Uh, risk management is a methodology that's actually used to minimize risk when developing systems. Uh, reducing risk is, it should be an ongoing process. Okay? Uh, well, you know, when, when I'm talking about this, it just sounds um, simple. But uh, I'll show you some practical cases uh, later on uh, where you can appreciate uh, that risk is very important to take into account. Uh, because if you do not take risk into account, uh, you probably end up not developing the system. Uh, the customer may come back and say, you know what, you are taking too long, or this is getting to be too expensive. 
So we're going to call the whole thing off. So risk is very critical. Uh, this picture shows um, the, uh, this, is, this is from, um, this is taken from Kosiakov and Sweet. Uh, this is based on practical experience that uh, the amount of risk, so this one shows uh, program risk, a uh, program deals with um, a, a given project. This is, the, this is how risk is going to vary. When you are doing the needs analysis, uh, this is where you have the highest risk. So in the beginning, so it's very important that you, you get your needs analysis right. In the beginning, very important. Okay? If you start out on a wrong foot, uh, you basically may end up on the wrong foot. So the beginning is very important here, needs analysis. And there have been systems that have been, uh, were actually rushed in the beginning. The needs analysis was not well defined. And then eventually, by the time you get to uh, advanced development, you are trying to get the, you know, come up with a beautiful system design, you find that you can't, okay? Then end up, you end up um, terminating the entire program, system development project. So risk goes down like this over time. However, the effort is going to go up. And most of the effort is going to be expended in the engineering design. Okay? So risk is very important. In the beginning, you have to account for a lot of things. Uh, when we talk about uh, risk management, uh, we have what is known as risk assessment, uh, which deals with identifying uh, risk. So you have to identify the weakest and uh, most uncertain features of your system design. Uh, in our case, it's, it's, the focus is going to be on the unproven technology. Okay? But in practice, uh, certain components may be proven, but they may be more expensive and so on, or may be difficult to uh, acquire. So wh what is risk? Uh, risk is defined in, um, in many ways. Uh, mathematically, I think of risk as the probability of loss. Okay? Probability of loss. Um, that's how I think about uh, risk. We, uh, but in just in, in, in passing, we can say that uh, risk has two components. One of them is the likelihood, and the other one is criticality. Yeah? So likelihood is, a, is an estimate of the possibility of failure for a component of the system. What is the likelihood that this component is going to fail? That's uh, risk likelihood. Uh, risk criticality, on the other hand, is an estimate of the impact of failure. So this is going to be, a con it's going to be conditioned on the fact that the component has failed. Okay? So if the component uh, has failed, then what's going to be the impact um, on the costs? What's going to be the impact on the reliability of the system? Uh, if the system is in operation, uh, we also worry about, you know, what's going to be the impact on safety? Okay? So two components are associated with risk assessment, uh, the risk likelihood and the criticality. Okay. So how do you prevent risk? This is what is referred to as risk mitigation. Uh, so you have to monitor and basically take care of risk during the system development process. And uh, these are some of the things that you can do. Uh, when you go to industry, this is going to make much more sense. You remember what I'm saying now. <laughs> so uh, you have to do um, uh, intensi intensified technical and management reviews. Uh, if you're in charge of the program, you make sure you have reviews. Uh, special oversight uh, of designated component engineering. If you have certain critical components, make sure you have uh, special oversight. Uh, analysis and testing of critical design items. Uh, rapid prototyping. 
Okay, you think this is going to be a good conceptual uh, design for a particular component? Maybe you want to build something quickly and test it. Okay. Um, also, consideration of relieving critical design uh, requirements. Uh, sometimes some of the design requirements uh, may be too stringent. Okay, so you may have to go back to the customer and say, you know. This is what you want, but this is what the technology can do, okay? Um, uh, sometimes you also need to have uh, what is known as uh, fallback parallel developments. Uh, I can tell you several stories uh, from some of my colleagues in industry uh, who, when they're developing a, a, uh, some, some uh, new technology, uh, you don't put all your eggs in one basket, okay? So you basically have a team doing, you know, this is the main thing we want, but you also have a backup uh, or fallback plan where you're doing something, you know, it could be very different different or fairly different from what you're doing, okay, uh, in terms of the design. In case this big thing doesn't work, then you actually fall back on, on the, the backup plan, okay. So again, this is just uh, coming from experience. Okay, risk likelihood. Uh, this uh, table shows uh, the conditions when you can have high risk. Okay, when do you have high risk? When you have significant extension from previous designs. Okay, I gave an example of Boeing uh, designing the the newest plane, passenger plane, uh, that was a significant deviation from the previous designs in terms of the composite materials that are being used, the control systems, everything. And so uh, the risk is higher, okay? So you, you've seen what has happened, right? Uh, they have gone beyond their initial plan schedule. Um, you can also have high risk likelihood uh, if you have uh, multiple new and untried components, uh, complex components and, or interfaces. Uh, if you don't have very good analytical tools to use, uh, you can have uh, high risk. Uh, this one shows the medium. Again, this is more direct extension from previous designs. Previous designs, uh, we're talking about predecessor systems here, okay? Uh, you can have low risk likelihood uh, if you have using, you know, uh, well-qualified components, uh, components of medium complexity, and you have, you know, mature technologies and the tools that you need. Okay? The next one is uh, uh, risk criticality. Again, this one gives you some conditions. Uh, if a component or part of the system fails, what's going to be the impact? Uh, the impact is high uh, if uh, there is a major degradation in performance. And from practice, they are saying, you know, 50 to 90 percent. Or if uh, the system uh, poses a serious uh, safety problem. Okay? We talked about the, the Toyota recalls where... Um, you have issues with the braking system. Uh, that's high, I would say it's high crit criticality. Very high risk criticality because of uh, safety issues. Okay? And you can also think of it in terms of the program impact. Uh, so if a particular uh, component or subsystem fails, what's going to be the effect on your cost? What about the schedule? What about production cutbacks? Okay. And then we can also look at uh, when you have medium and, and low risk criticality. Okay. So in, uh, in closing, there is no general agreement uh, on the best organization in terms of how systems engineering has to be done. Uh, so each organization has its own way of doing systems engineering. Um, 
and I mentioned here that it is important that all participants uh, are aware of their position in the organization. Um, as a systems engineer, uh, it's a big responsibility to actually coordinate, coordinate the goals of developing a new system. Uh, one thing I should also mention is the <coughs> when uh, developing software, there is a standard uh, that you have to meet. Uh, similarly, this has extended to uh, technological systems, or physical systems. Uh, it's known as the Systems Engineering Capability Maturity Assessment. Um, so this is an extension from the, the software. So if somebody make, make, comes up with new software, it has to go through testing, and it has to pass certain standards to consider it as a mature uh, software. And this is now being done for, for systems as well. And uh, especially in the, uh, in the defense industry. Okay, and one of, uh, one of the distance learning students is proposing a system that's going to actually do this capability maturity assessment uh, for certain uh, uh, products, probably defense related products. Okay? And this one just gives you the, the new systems engineering standards. Okay, I'm done. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, I think I'm going to stop here. I was planning to, to start on this one. But what I'll do is I'll let you take a look at those slides, and then Tuesday we are going to go through these. Uh, uh, these slides were developed by Professor Bayhill at the University of Arizona. Uh, I presented uh, these slides last semester, and students liked them, so I decided to do it again. Uh, so this one actually is going to give us a more detailed analysis of UML and how it is actually applied to develop a system. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to look at a case study that was done. Uh, this case study is for designing a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Uh, for a house in, in Arizona, in Tucson, okay? So this is not a complex system for us, but it provides a good um, case study for teaching. So we're going to go through these slides, and you'll see the different uh, UML diagrams and how they are used, okay? All right. If there are no questions, uh, have a good weekend.